They warn us that a holy war is coming. Blood must flow. There must be widows. There must be orphans. In cities across America, they preach their message of hatred and death. And if they stand in our way, we wage jihad for the sake of Allah. One shadowy figure emerges to spearhead their holy war. It was like Elvis. Every time you read about a terrorist group in a different country carrying out violent action, you heard the name Osama bin Laden. They attack a symbol of America's global dominance, but fail to destroy it. Al-Qaeda is a learning organization, continuously learning, so that it will be successful in the next attack. They vow to try again with a new, bolder plan. If you had a plane, you could turn it into a missile. You could fly it into a building and you kill a lot of people with it. We do not differentiate between those dressed in military uniforms and civilians. He said, I predict a black day for the United States, a day uh, after which the United States will not be the same as we know it. Osama bin Laden selects four young men to lead his attack on America. They all knew before they left Kandahar that they were going to die for Allah. How? They don't know. The warnings were, were clear, both inside the White House and from the CIA. They're coming. They want to kill Americans. The men scout their targets, train their crews, prepare for the day. They were among us. It's not like they had two heads or horns or anything like that where you could immediately identify them as people who were coming to kill us. Portland, Maine. Tuesday, September 11, 2001. Dawn breaks through a cloudless New England sky. Two men enter the Portland jet port. They approach the first class counter for U.S. Airways. They present one-way tickets for the 6 a.m. flight to Boston with a connecting flight to Los Angeles. One of them, Mohammed Atta, bought the tickets online two weeks earlier using a visa card. The first thing I noticed, like, these are $2,500 tickets. You don't see those too often, really. It's even at the first class check-in county, you don't see them too often. The two men are asked the standard security questions. Has anyone unknown to you asked you to carry any items on board the aircraft today? And have any of the items that you're traveling with been out of your control since the time you packed them? The ticket agent is immediately troubled by the expression on Otta's face. He had the most hateful look. He had the most angry look on his face. And I had never gotten a feeling like this. I looked at him and I'm thinking, my God, I sensed anger. I said to myself, if this doesn't look like an Arab terrorist, nobody does. But the ticket agent takes another look and decides to let go of his suspicion. I actually gave myself a little slap, a mental slap, saying, oh, they had the ties and jackets on, they look like a couple of businessmen. Atta and the second man, Abdulaziz Alamari, are waved on. Their luggage is tagged and checked. They're given their boarding passes and directed to their gate. Two minutes later, this security camera videotape captures them, no longer wearing their ties or sport coats. It is 5.45 a.m. At three airports along the East Coast, 17 other young Arab men dressed in business attire are making their way through security checkpoints. Three of them, like Mohammed Atta, have pilot training. All the others are so-called muscle hijackers. Their job will be to break into the cockpits and subdue the crew and passengers. Then, the pilot hijackers can take control of the planes. 
For the past four months, several of the men have been taking surveillance flights on airlines across the country. Checking airport security measures. Observing the behavior and routines of flight crews. Noting when the seatbelt sign is turned off, when cabin service begins, whether cockpits are guarded or locked. Boston, 6.45 a.m. Two teams of hijackers, ten men in all, begin to check in at Logan Airport. Two of the men have difficulty understanding the security questions. Helpful counter-agents repeat them until the men give the correct answers. Three of them are randomly chosen for a luggage search, but all make it through security with relative ease. Past the security gates, five men board American Flight 11 for Los Angeles. Among them is pilot Mohammed Atta, who has arrived from Portland. The other five board United Flight 175, also bound for LA. Among them is pilot Marwan El Shehi, the Hamburg cell member who knew the most about the Koran. Newark, New Jersey, 7.24 a.m. Muscle hijacker Ahmed Al Hasnawi is randomly selected to have his checked luggage searched. The other men, including pilot Ziad Jarrah, passed through security at Newark Airport without incident. Jarrah called his wife in Europe earlier that morning to say he loved her. All four men board United Flight 93, bound for San Francisco. Dulles, Virginia, 7.29 a.m. Two brothers, who are both muscle hijackers, Nawef and Salim Al-Hazmi, are selected for extra scrutiny at the American Airlines check-in counter here at Dulles Airport. One of them does not have photo ID and does not speak English. Their baggage is held off the plane until it is confirmed they have boarded. Seen here, Nawef Al-Hazmi is checked with a hand wand. This video from a security camera shows an unidentified item in his back pocket. But he is not searched further or questioned. All five men are allowed to board American Airlines Flight 77 to Los Angeles. 8 a.m. All 19 hijackers have passed through security checkpoints. Several men carry knives with blades less than four inches long, items that at the time the FAA allows on planes. The choice of transcontinental flights is key to the plot. Flights 11 and 175 carry nearly 24,000 gallons of fuel. Flights 77 and 93 carry over 11,000 gallons. 8.14 a.m. American Flight 11 and United Flight 175, both from Boston to L.A., are airborne. Flight 11 nears its cruising altitude. The captain likely turns off the seatbelt sign. At the front of the plane, two female flight attendants prepare for cabin service. In row two, brothers Wail al-Sheri and Walid al-Sheri rise from their first-class seats. They walk up to the flight attendants and stab them. As the women lay crumpled on the floor, pilot Mohammed Atta rises from seat 8D. A passenger seated behind Atta tries to intervene, but he is stabbed, most likely by Satam al-Sakami. The hijackers breach the cockpit and overpower First Officer Thomas McGinnis and Captain John Oganowski. Within minutes, Atta is at the flight controls. The other muscle hijackers spray mace to prevent the passengers and remaining flight attendants from moving to the front of the plane. From the rear, flight attendant Betty Ong uses an air phone to call the American Airlines Reservation Office in Cary, North Carolina. The call is recorded. Okay, my name is Betty Ong. 
I'm number three on flight 11. Okay. Our, our number one is, got stabbed. Uh, our person is stabbed. Um, nobody knows who stabbed who, and we, we can't even get up to business class right now because nobody can breathe. And we can't get a, the cockpit. The door won't open. Um, what this is operations. What flight number are we talking about? Flight 12. Flight 12. Okay. No, we're on flight 11 right now. This is flight 11. It's flight 11. Boston to Los Angeles. 8.21 a.m. Someone in the cockpit turns off the transponder, the device that transmits the plane's altitude and identity. It can still be tracked, but it's now more difficult. Can anybody get up to the cockpit? Can anybody get up to the cockpit? Okay, we can't even get into the cockpit. We don't know who's up there. Well, if they were shrewd, they would keep the door closed and... I'm sorry? Would they not maintain a sterile cockpit? I think the guys are up there. They might have gone their, gone their way up there or, or something. Nobody can call the cockpit. We can't even get inside. The North Carolina Reservation Supervisor keeps Betty Ong on the phone. On another line, she calls the American Airlines Operations Center in Fort Worth, Texas. American Airlines emergency line, please state your emergency. Hey, this is Nettie, American Airlines calling. I am monitoring a call in which Flight 11, the flight attendant is advising our ref that the pilot, everyone's been stabbed. Flight 11? Yep. Then, Mohammed Atta's voice crackles over an air controller's headphones. We have a complaint. Just stay quiet and you'll be okay. We're returning to the airport. One of the hijackers may have hit the wrong button in the cockpit. Atta seems to think he's speaking only to the passengers. In fact, his voice is being heard and recorded by air traffic controllers. Nobody move. Everything will be okay. If you try to make any move, yourself and the airplane. Just stay quiet. Uh, we contacted air traffic control. They are going to handle this for the confirmed hijacking. So they're moving all the traffic out of this aircraft's way. Okay. Uh, he turned his transponder off, so we don't have a definitive altitude for him. Uh, we're just going by. They, they seem to think that they have him on a primary radar. They seem to think that he is descending. Okay. 8.27 a.m. American Flight 11 suddenly veers from its flight plan. Then, a third communication from the cockpit. Everybody move, please. We're going back to the airport. Don't try to make any stupid moves. Rome, New York, 8.37 a.m. At the headquarters of the Northeast Air Defense Sector, or NEADS, a call comes in from the FAA. We have a hijacked aircraft headed towards New York, and we need you guys to, we need someone to scramble some S-16s or something up there to help us out. The Air National Guard officer is in the midst of a training exercise and seeks clarification. Is this, is this real world or exercise? No, this is not an exercise manifest. By now, Flight 77 from Dulles to Los Angeles has already taken off. In a matter of minutes, it, too, will be commandeered by a team of five hijackers. And in Newark, New Jersey, the final group of Al-Qaeda operatives are aboard United Flight 93 to San Francisco, taxiing toward the runway. 8.42 a.m. Flight 93 takes off late. This fourth plane will soon be overtaken by a team of hijackers led by pilot Ziad Jarrah. All four planes are now in the air. Moments later, over northern New Jersey, the assault begins on board United 175. Most likely, the two muscle hijackers, Fayez Bani Hamid and Mohan Al Shari, move first, rising from seats 2A and 2B. They stab a flight attendant. They storm the cockpit and stab both pilots. The muscle hijackers herd passengers and crew toward the rear of the cabin. Then, pilot Marwan al-Shehi takes the controls. Back inside the cockpit of Flight 11 from Boston, Mohammed Atta, the stern ringleader of the plot, 
is following the Hudson River to the southern tip of Manhattan. I'm still on with security, okay, Betty? You're doing a great job. Just, just stay calm, okay? As the North Carolina agent stays on the phone with Betty Ong, she is simultaneously receiving updates from the Texas Operations Center. Okay, we're contacting a flight crew now. We're, all con uh, we're also contacting ATC. Okay. It seems like the passengers in the coach might not be aware of what's going on right now. These two passengers were from first class. Okay, hold on. Hey, Betty. Do you know any information as far as the gentleman men that are in the cockpit with the pilot? Were they from first class? They were sitting in two A and B. New York. This is 1010 Winds. You give us 22 minutes, we'll give you the world. Good morning. 64 degrees at 8 o'clock. It's Tuesday, September 11th. I'm Lee Harris. Here's what's happening. It's primary day, and the polls are open in New York City. When you live in New York, uh, people say, oh, how crowded this place is. I ask myself, what crowd? There's no crowd here. This is life. This is life in the big city. You don't think about it. I mean, it's like breathing. Regular start of a day, there were a lot of trading firms, uh, Wall Street type of trading firms that got there earlier. We, we have casual dress, and um, that day I was dressed in a suit. I was, were under contract to a firm, a career transition firm. It was the second day of two-day class. I told the class Monday, I said to them, try not to be late. 8.43 a.m. American Airlines flight attendant Amy Sweeney has been on the phone with an airline supervisor at Boston's Logan Airport for 11 minutes. She reports that the passengers are under the impression that there's a routine medical emergency in first class. About 8.44 a.m., Sweeney reports, we are flying low. We are flying very, very low. We are flying way too low. Seconds later, she says, oh my God, we are way too low. I was walking away from my office, uh, I think, to, uh, to pick up a fax or something. And I was sitting there, uh, waiting for the class, reading through the resumes. I, I just exited the elevator on the 89th floor with another fellow. He goes to the left, I go to the right. On board Flight 11, the call between flight attendant Betty Ong and the North Carolina Reservation supervisor is cut off. What's going on, Betty? Betty, talk to me. Betty, are you there? I think we might have lost her. It lifted me and threw 225 pounds right into a wall. I, at that point in time, my life stopped. I thought we were going over. I heard this enormous explosion and the building swayed. The ceiling fell and collapsed. And I remember the resumes starting to fly out of the room. I'm sitting there and a resume just passes me by and stays in the middle of the air so much so that I could read the name and then it floated by. American Flight 11 has ripped through floors 93 to 99 of the North Tower of the World Trade Center. Over 20,000 gallons of jet fuel ignite. The inferno roars down at least one of the building's elevator banks. It explodes on floors 77, 22, and the west side lobby. All three of the building's stairwells become impassable from the 92nd floor up. 8.51 a.m. As American Flight 77 from Dulles nears the border of West Virginia and Ohio, the third group of hijackers makes its move. The men wield utility knives as they storm the cockpit. Hani Hanjour, the Saudi pilot who is trained in American flight school since 1996, takes control of the plane. 8.54 a.m. Hanjour diverts the plane from its flight path to Los Angeles. He heads south and then back east toward Washington, D.C.
Portland, Maine. The ticket agent who checked in Mohammed Atta and Abdulaziz Alomari has just learned about Flight 11 from a colleague. She said, geez, did you hear what happened in New York? I said, no, she says a plane hit the World Trade Center. She says, yeah, it was an L.A. flight. And I just froze. I said, Boston, L.A., yeah. I said, oh, my God. I says, I put two guys on that plane. I was feeling horrible. Here I am thinking that these guys were terrorists and, and, and now they're dead. I was feeling awful about that. Rome, New York. The operations floor at the Northeast Air Defense Sector headquarters. Two F-15 fighter jets have been scrambled to track American Flight 11, the plane which has already crashed into the North Tower. Not only is the FAA needing help with the hijacking, they can't tell us where it is, uh, which makes our problem that much more, more difficult. A technician has a television on in the computer maintenance room. He runs in and tells Colonel Robert Marr that an aircraft has hit the Twin Towers. You could see his face was kind of ashen, and, and we decided very quickly we needed, to get, uh, we needed to get a TV station in the battle cab to help us with our decision-making process because those were the guys with the eyes on the scene telling us what was going on. We believe a commercial jet has crashed into one of the towers of the World Trade Center and you can see the smoke billowing out, there are flames billowing out there, and a commercial jet crashing into one of these towers. New York City firemen, police, and rescue workers are already on the scene, with hundreds more en route. At the North Tower, more than 1,300 people are trapped above the impact zone. How do you put a fire out that high? That's a good question. Fighting a fire that for high up with the amount of fuel that was there is almost impossible. You're not going to put a fire out that, that high. You're not going to put a fire out that big if it's in a cornfield in the middle of, you know, Nebraska. 8.57 a.m. A fire chief orders the first ladder and engine company to ascend stairwell C, reach the impact level on the 93rd floor, and report back. Each fireman carries almost 100 pounds of equipment. On 86, career counselor Louis Leshy and several others have taken refuge in a Port Authority office. Acrid smoke fills the room. They break a window. Immediately, air rushed in, but it stung us. These tiny little pieces of metal came around the building and into our window. And that's what stung us and was hot. on Konkama, New York, 9.01 a.m. To one unidentified manager at this air traffic control center on Long Island, the time for military action is now. We have several situations going on here. It's uh, escalating big, big time. We need to get the military involved with us. We're, we're involved with something else. We have other aircraft that may have a similar situation going on here. The similar situation he's referring to is a blip on his radar screen. It shows that United Flight 175 from Boston, originally bound for L.A., is now over central New Jersey, and it's headed for lower Manhattan. Hijacker pilot Marwan El Shehi, who had encouraged the other members of the Hamburg cell to embrace martyrdom, is moments away from his target. Good morning, and it is not a good morning in New York City. A major disaster, a plane crash into the World Trade Center. In the skies over New Jersey on United Flight 175, software salesman Peter Hansen is huddled with the other passengers in the back of the plane. He calls his father and describes the situation. A flight attendant has been stabbed. The plane is flying erratically. Some passengers are vomiting. He says, I think they intend to go to Chicago or someplace and fly into a building. Don't worry, Dad. If it happens, it'll be very fast. Nine oh one a.m. A plane has crashed into the north tower of the World Trade Center. I don't know if you got to work or you're still at home, but I left a message there also. 
Uh, there was an, a, an explosion, or at least I heard an explosion in the second building of the World Trade Center. It's fire, it's flames, and it's unbelievable. And everybody's on the street looking. It's really amazing. Well, hi there. Just had massive explosion in the World Trade Center complex. They're trying to evacuate now. People are getting out. Talk to you later. Bye. The city's 911 system is overwhelmed with calls. We are unable to complete your call due to the emergency in Lower Manhattan. Office workers are watching the tragedy unfold in the North Tower from their offices in the undamaged South Tower. Two of them. Ed Nichols and Ling Young have descended to the packed 78th floor sky lobby. We went downstairs to 78. Of course, by then, it's jam-packed with people. And as we were standing there, we were being told that we should return to our offices. That the problem had been confined to the North Tower and that um, we should go back to work. Bank executive Stanley Premnath and some of his co-workers take an elevator from their 81st floor office down to the lobby. Once there, a guard assures them it's safe to go back up to their office. They return to the elevator. Premnath hesitates. In my mind, something is wrong. I'm looking at these men, and they're waiting on me. Come on, stand a man, Jack is saying. You're not scared to go back up. Hijacker Marwan El Shehi at the controls of United 175 is over the northern suburbs of New Jersey. He is steering the plane toward the World Trade Center. And somebody keeps coasting, but it looks like he's going into one of the small airports down there. Second, I'm trying to bring him up. I'm just out of 9,500, 9,000 now. 9.02 a.m. Air traffic controllers track the plane's rapid descent to shockingly low altitudes. Do you know who he is? We just, we just, we don't know who he is. We're just picking him up now. All right, heads up, man. It looks like another one. All right. New York. And I walk back into the office. I'm looking towards the Statue of Liberty now, that direction. And a giant aircraft caught my eyes. And this plane is coming closer, closer, closer towards me. I can still see this big U on this plane. Goodness, there's another this one. This seems to be on purpose. It's 9.03 a.m. There is no longer any doubt that America is under attack. And there's more oh, explosions there's, oh, right now. Hold on, people are running. Hold, hold on. on just a moment. We've got an explosion inside. The building's that... exploding right now. you got people running up the street. Okay. Hold on, I'll tell you what's going on. Oh, my goodness. Now you... Plane? Now it's obvious, I think, that, uh, that there's a second plane just crashed into the World Trade Center. I think we have a terrorist act of proportions that we cannot begin to imagine at this juncture. The plane smashed into the building, the bottom wing slides right to my office, and the plane wing is stuck in the office door 20 feet from where I am. Oh, good lord. This is terrible. It was just, just, just a tremendous force of, of pressure. It was just like all hell breaking loose. Every wall was knocked down, broken up like matchsticks. I um, looked around, like I said, you don't see anything. All you see is these people laying around. They all gone. All I know is it's like a land of dead people. And then there's a couple of us who's alive. And I said, oh my God, what are we going to do? And just moments ago, so maybe 18 minutes after the first uh, impact, the second tower was impacted with a, by another, what appeared to be another passenger plane. Boston. At the city's air traffic control center, flight controllers are reviewing a warning to passengers from Mohammed Atta. His plane, American Flight 11, has already crashed into the North Tower. Are you still there? Yes, I am. I'm going to reconfirm with, uh, with downstairs that uh, he, uh, as far as the tape, seems to think that the guy said that we have planes, not 
don't know if it was because of the accent or if there's more than one, but uh, I'm going to I'm going to reconfirm that for you, uh, and I'll get back to you real quick, okay? Appreciate it. Get what? Planes, as in plural. New York. It's 9.05 on WCBS New York, and we are covering for you uh, a, a couple of explosions. Planes have crashed into each of the towers of the World Trade Center just within the last few minutes. All you hear are sirens uh, racing by me, and they're going toward the Trade Center. We're going towards the Trade Center. Debris was raining down from the towers, glass, papers, they uh, were all over the place. Everybody was running away from us, and these people had horror on their faces. Sarasota, Florida, 9.05 a.m. President Bush is visiting a second grade classroom at the Booker Elementary School. White House Chief of Staff Andrew Card enters the room. He whispers in the president's ear. A second plane hit the second tower. America is under attack. According to the 9-11 Commission report, Bush remains in the classroom for five to seven minutes as the children finish a exercise. He then returns to a holding room where he is briefed by staff. New York. On the 86th floor of the North Tower, Louis Leshy stays close to the floor below the smoke. He picks up the phone and dials his wife. She answers on the first ring. I said to her, honey, I'm in the World Trade Center. Something has happened. I have no idea what's happened. Um, I don't know if I'm going to get out of this. I love you and I hung up. Three floors up. Insurance manager Nathan Goldwasser watches as one of his colleagues tries to open the emergency exit to stairway C. He was banging with the side of his body to try to, you know, open the door. But the door, twisted by the force of the blast, won't budge. One floor below, Port Authority construction inspector Pablo Ortiz and two of his co-workers hear the pounding. Suddenly someone from the other side says, get away from the door, we just naturally backed off. And the next thing I remember very clearly was a crowbar came through the drywall, the drywall next to the door. The crowbar loosens the jammed door. Goldwasser and others are able to push it open and descend to safety. Their rescuers remain on the 89th floor, checking offices for trapped employees. As they search, Pablo Ortiz discovers 11 people gathered in Walter Polipiak's office. A fellow who appeared in my door who I recognized, but I did not know. When he said, let's go, I didn't ask questions. I just got up and followed his instructions and followed him out into the hall. Ortiz leads Polipiak to the open stairwell. Then he joins his co-workers as they continue in their search. On the 86th floor, they find Louis Leshy. You couldn't see anything. And someone said, anybody in here? And we said, yes. And they said, all right, this way. And that's what you did. You followed. Pablo Ortiz and his colleagues lead dozens of people to stairwells. Not once do they choose to follow them down. That's the difference between people like me and heroes who stop and say, is there anybody I can help get out? I don't know. You know, heroism is someone maybe who's so afraid, who's so frightened that gets fed up and says, damn it. I'm not going to let this happen, not only to me, but to somebody else. Ortiz and his co-workers are last seen on the 78th floor, continuing their methodical floor-by-floor -floor sweep. Rome, New York, 9.08 a.m. The headquarters of the Northeast Air Defense Sector, or NEADS, the Air National Guard officers know they are at war. We need to talk to FAA. We need to tell them if this stuff's going to keep on going. We need to take those fighters, put them over Manhattan. That's the best thing. That's the best play right now. 
Niaz orders two fully armed F-15 fighters which have been circling out over the Atlantic to head to New York City. New York. In a stairwell in the South Tower of the World Trade Center, near the impact zone, financial broker Brian Clark hears a strange noise. I was distracted by this banging noise inside the 81st floor, and I strained to hear the stranger voice yelling, Help, help, I'm buried. Is anyone there? I can't breathe. The voice belongs to Stanley Premnath. His office suffered a direct hit when United Flight 175 sliced through the South Tower. By this point, I'm swollen. 95% of my body is black and blue. I'm covered in blood, stuck on with pulverized cement. I couldn't see anything until suddenly, just two feet in front of me, was this hand waving, and I focused. It sort of startled me. And we realized that the only way out was for him to go up and over this wall. I can't do this. Think about your family. You must do this. I can't do this. Try, and I'll catch you from the other side. I jumped the first time. Tried to grab on top of that wall, and I missed. I said, you must do this. I was emphatic. Up he came. I somehow hooked under his armpit or around his neck and lifted him up with all my strength. The next thing I know, I'm lying on top of this man, and I reach down, and I grab him, and I give him a kiss. And I sort of backed up a bit. I said, I'm Brian. And he said, I'm Stanley. I said, well, Oak, Stanley, let's go. 9.19 a.m. United Flight 93 to San Francisco is over central Pennsylvania. A United Flight dispatcher composes a text message warning to other United planes in the air, informing pilots about the terrorist attacks at the World Trade Center. But because that same dispatcher is responsible for multiple flights, his message won't be transmitted to Flight 93 for four more minutes. American Flight 77 from Dulles is now over Northern Virginia. Passenger Barbara Olson, a prominent conservative commentator, calls her husband Ted at his office in Washington. Ted Olson is the Solicitor General of the United States. She told me that the plane was hijacked and she and the other passengers had been herded to the back of the airplane. At some point, we were, the call was broken. The phone went dead. New York. The South Tower of the World Trade Center. Hundreds of people who had been waiting in the 78th floor sky lobby when the plane hit are now dead or badly injured. Tax auditor Ling Young is severely burned and in shock. It's just completely like a war zone. Then I see a woman next to me, and she couldn't move. She used to help me. I said, I don't know what to do. I said, well, why don't we just stay still? Don't do anything. Wait for help. Young and her co-workers do not wait for long. Appearing in the smoke is Wells Crowther, a 24-year-old equities trader from the 104th floor. Crowther leads Young and others to an open stairwell. He trails behind for 16 floors, carrying an injured woman on his back before returning up the stairs to assist more. He is never seen again. Rome, New York, 9.21 a.m. Niads has still not been told that American Flight 77 from Dulles to L.A. is a hijack. In fact, officials cannot even keep straight which planes are in the air and which ones have already crashed into the World Trade Center. Just had a report that American 11 is still in the air and it's on its way towards heading towards Washington. Okay, American 11 is still in the air? Yes, on its way towards there was another, there was another aircraft that hit the tower. That's the latest report we have. That's where uh, we really got into the confusion or what I'll call the fog of war. Okay, so American 11 isn't a hijack at all then, right? No, he is a hijack. He, the American 11 is a hijack. Yes. And it's he's going into Washington? It's to be a third aircraft. Niaz readies two fighters to take off from Langley Air Force Base in Virginia. American Flight 77 is less than 15 minutes from the Pentagon when Marr orders the fighters into the air. 
At the Justice Department, Ted Olson receives a second call from his wife, Barbara, aboard Flight 77. She tells him that the hijackers have knives. She asks him, what can she do to help? I ask her, where was the plane? What direction was it? Because um, I had this over, overpowering premonition that it was coming to Washington. Barbara Olson replies that the plane is flying over a residential area. Ted Olson tells his wife what's happened in New York. I told her because I felt I had to. So I, in a sense, had to tell her that um, how bleak... Um, how bleak the situation was. At some point, um, that call just came to a stop. I mean, again, the connection was broken, and I didn't hear from her again. Nine twenty-four a.m. in the skies over eastern Ohio, pilot Jason Dahl of United Airlines Flight ninety-three finally receives his text message warning from flight dispatch. Beware any cockpit intrusion, it reads. Two aircraft hit World Trade Center. Dahl is incredulous and requests verification. Ed, he types, confirm latest message, please, Jason. Before he receives a response, the hijackers storm Dahl's cockpit. Three muscle hijackers, Ahmed al-Haznawi, Ahmed al-Nami, and Saeed al-Hamdi overpowered Dahl and his flight crew. An air traffic controller in Cleveland hears a mayday call and the sounds of a struggle. He sees United 93 plunging 700 feet on his radar screen. The air traffic controller radios United 93 several times. No answer. Ziad Jarrah. The Hamburg cell member who called his wife that morning to say he loved her is now in control of the plane. Air traffic controllers hear this message from Jarrah. Uh, in first class, passenger Tom Burnett calls his wife Dina by cell phone. He speaks calmly. Dina can hear commotion in the background. My first words to him were, Tom, you're okay. And he said, no, I'm not. I'm on an airplane that has been hijacked. And for a brief moment, I tied all of that together, realizing that he was part of what was going on on television. Burnett tells his wife that hijackers have stabbed a passenger and taken over the plane. He asks her to contact the authorities and hangs up. I remember standing in the middle of the kitchen with the children around me asking to talk to their dad and I felt paralyzed. Who do I call? Who do I call for a hijack? Sarasota, Florida, 9.29 a.m. President Bush makes a brief statement before taking off in Air Force One. Uh, today we've had a national tragedy. Uh, two airplanes have crashed into the World Trade Center in an apparent terrorist attack on our country. Right now, what there is is there's a crush of, of emergency vehicles and rescue vehicles, but they don't seem to be quite organized in any direction. Um, there's fire While news of the World Trade Center attack is broadcast around the country, firemen are making their blind ascent in the stairwells of the Twin Towers. 78 teams have taken the brunt of the stuff. There's a lot of bodies. They said the stairway is clear all the way up, though. All right, 10-4, Scott, what, what uh, floor are you on? 48 right now. All right, 10-4, we're coming up behind you. I'm going down, and there was a point where we stopped, and this fireman is on the same step as me. He looked at me, and I looked at him, and that look, he knew where he was going. I didn't. And that's what I found very, very 
interesting. He knew exactly where he was going, and he didn't miss a goddamn step. And I knew where I was going, and I was tripping. And I thought that was magnificent. In the stairwell of the South Tower, Lynn Young is carefully working her way down the stairs. On the 51st floor, Young meets Fire Marshal Ronald Buka and his partner. Buka knows the World Trade Center well. He kept a set of blueprints in his locker after investigating the 1993 bombing, convinced that terrorists would one day return to finish the job. His partner stays behind to assist Young as Buka continues climbing stairs two at a time toward the impact zone. Outside, news cameraman Jack Telliercio has gained access to the plaza between the two towers. The plaza was completely empty. There was debris everywhere. The strangest thing about being out there uh, was that the music that normally would play out in the plaza, so this outdoor music, was still playing on the loudspeakers. All around the towers, people can hear another sound, one they will never forget. Every couple of seconds, you would hear a bang. And what that bang was was a body hitting the ground. It was the most god-awful sound you can imagine. You would, like, just cringe, knowing that someone else just died. Someone else just died, and someone else just died. Yeah, it was uh, it was tough to see that. Yeah, it was. You know, I mean, I, I witnessed at least twenty people deciding to, you know, free themselves from whatever hell they were in, and uh, you know, and, and jump. There was one girl in particular that I remember. This woman came out on some kind of a jagged beam. Uh, glass blew out, flame shot out, black smoke. The fire had now reached her floor. And um, she's standing there, and I guess she gave up hope. And uh, she blessed herself. And she looked up to the sky and put her arms out, stretched her arms out, and just jumped. I looked up and I saw sort of like a, a waving way up on like the 90th floor. There was a man wearing a suit and he was hanging out of the window and waving his suit jacket frantically, like trying to call for help. It walked out onto the ledge and behind him was a raging, raging inferno. And after a, a few seconds, he started to kind of climb down the, 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 the face of the building. And as he was climbing down, it looked like he had some kind of rope or something. So he, he's kind of, he was making his way down, and then he lost his grip. Arlington, Virginia. Inside the Pentagon, Lieutenant Colonel Ted Anderson reports to work and learns about the World Trade Center attacks. I really started to feel uncomfortable, uh, started to sweat. Um, hair on the back of my neck, you know, was frizzed. National Security Council meeting. Back to you. 9.34 a.m. American Airlines Flight 77 is five miles southwest of the Pentagon. Jet fighters from Langley are in the air, but due to miscommunications, they are heading east, out over the Atlantic Ocean, more than 150 miles away from the Pentagon. The problem was, when you look at the radar coverage, he, he went down low and fast, got below anybody's radar coverage, so nobody knew where he was. Lieutenant Colonel Anderson is on the phone with his wife, speaking from his office in the Pentagon's C-Ring. 
Army accountant Sheila Moody is about to send a fax from her office in the outermost E-ring. And hijacker pilot Hani Hanjour, chosen by Osama bin Laden when another man couldn't get a U.S. visa, has Washington in his sights. He is closing in fast. New York. That there has been massive loss of life in New York City this morning. This makes the uh, World Trade Center bombing of about nine years ago look like a relatively minor incident. The Twin Towers are in flames. Phone lines are jammed as people inside the towers and out try to reach loved ones, perhaps for the last time. Quality, I saw it. I saw it. the explosion. I just need to know that you're okay, sweetheart. Morning, wake up right now. Turn on the news. Turn on the news right now. I'm so worried about you. Where are you? I hope you're okay. I hope you're on your way over here. I'm in the World Trade Center. The building was hit by something. I, I don't know if I'm going to get out, but I love you very much. Communication is difficult for firefighters as well. a.m. Hijacker pilot Ziad Jarrah is at the controls of United Airlines Flight 93. He's flying over eastern Ohio when he begins to turn the aircraft around and head toward Washington, D.C. Jarrah's target, according to statements made later by Al-Qaeda leaders, is the U.S. Capitol building. His three lieutenants are armed with knives. They have stabbed at least one passenger. In first class, passenger Tom Burnett checks for a pulse on the stabbing victim. The man is dead. The muscle hijackers then order Burnett, a 38-year-old medical supplies executive, to the back of the plane, along with the other passengers. Burnett watches the hijackers disappear behind the curtain that separates first class and coach. He calls his wife Dina at their home in San Ramon, California. She tells him about the World Trade Center attacks. He wanted to know who was involved, how many airplanes, which airline, what did they want. The news spreads among the passengers. Salesman Jeremy Glick phones his wife Liz they will stay connected for the next 26 minutes. He asked me if this was true. I hesitate for a minute and then I tell him, yeah, it's true. There are crashing planes there. He asked me if I think the guy um, who claims he has a bomb really has a bomb. And I said, I don't think it is a bomb. I think he's bluffing you. 9.34 a.m. Five miles west of the Pentagon, American Airlines Flight 77 begins rapidly descending from an altitude of 2,200 feet. Hijacker pilot Hani Hanjour aims the plane's nose at the Pentagon and punches the throttles to maximum power. American 77 plunges toward its target at 530 miles an hour. I remember hearing the sound of an airplane engine, that, that whistling sound when they're descending at... Firefighter Alan Wallace is fixing his truck along the Pentagon's west perimeter outside the heliport fire station. He and a colleague look up in time to see the plane hurtling toward them. Skipper and I had enough time for me to yell, let's go. 9.37 a.m. 
These surveillance photographs capture Flight 77's exact moment of impact with the Pentagon. The structure completely lifts the, the walls, cave in. Just a, a huge burst of hot air just hit me in the face. The fireball was approximately 50 feet in the air, and this was right behind us. When I opened my eyes, it was like somebody was standing there with a flamethrower. American 77 slices through the Pentagon's outermost E-ring, striking wall after wall of reinforced concrete and steel beams. The fuselage disintegrates as it plows through the D and C rings. It reaches 310 feet inside the building. Fireballs ricochet along the corridors. People scramble for a way out through the flames. There was a window to the right of me, and I um, tried to hit it with my hand to see if I could break it, but it was at tempered glass. I remember I left a blood print of my hand on the window. In the C ring, Lieutenant Colonel Ted Anderson, a veteran of Desert Storm, leads a group of 50 people to the emergency exits. Security guys came running down the hallway and said there are shooters in the parking lot. And I just refused to believe that we were under small arms attack from the mall. So I kicked open one of the security doors myself and screamed for everybody to move my way. Sergeant First Class Chris Brayman, an Army Ranger, evacuates from an undamaged section of the Pentagon. Brayman sees black smoke rising over the building. He sprints to the crash site. It had every bit of the sounds of combat, um, the smells, the, the screams, and the horrors. Um, as I looked up, I just said, Dear Lord, give us the strength for what I'm about to do. Sergeant Brayman runs towards the inferno. So does Lieutenant Colonel Anderson. The breach in the Pentagon is two stories tall and 75 feet wide. Together, Anderson and Brayman climb through a broken first floor window near the explosion. They begin pulling out survivors. As we're going through the smoky hallways, there was a bright light that ran in front of us. That's when Sergeant Brayman yelled for me, Sir, help me. It was a uh, human being. He tripped and fell forward, and uh, we jumped on top of him. The entire front portion of his body had literally been burned completely off of him. There was no color in his eyes. And I thought, my God, he doesn't have any eyes. As Brayman and Anderson carry the man outside, he pleads for them to help his co-workers. He's screaming, you've got to get these people out. They're behind me. There are people behind me. So immediate reaction is to hand him somebody and get back in there. Fifty feet from the point of impact, Army accountant Sheila Moody is trapped inside her office. She's surrounded by flames. The smoke and the fumes started taking my breath away, and a voice in my head just said to clap your hands. So I started clapping my hands together as loud and as hard as I could. Moody feels herself losing consciousness. Sergeant Chris Brayman slips through a gap in the wall. And then she says, is anybody there? Is anybody there? And um, that's when I noticed a woman on the ground. I could see just through the smoke for a split second, and I reached over. All I remember is he was reaching through the clouds and grabbing her. Brayman carries Sheila Moody out of the building and delivers her to medics. Over eastern Ohio, hijacker pilot Ziad Jarrah is in the cockpit of United Flight 93. His target is the U.S. Capitol building. This time, America's last line of defense becomes the passengers themselves. Tom Burnett and Jeremy Glick are among those who will lead the charge. He told me he was putting a plan together to take back the airplane. He had told me, all right, the guy with the bomb looks kind of small. He's no match for me. I can take him. Arlington, Virginia. 9.45 a.m. 
a scene that is eerily reminiscent of what we saw at the World Trade Center. Thick black smoke now emanating from the Pentagon. Eight minutes after the attack on the Pentagon, the White House orders a full evacuation. Presidential speechwriter David Frum files out of the executive office building. Those corridors that were always so empty, suddenly they are thronged with people. And they're walking fast. And the, the guards restrain us and say, don't run. And then a second or two later, they change their minds and they say, run! From a bunker underneath the East Wing, Vice President Dick Cheney has phoned President Bush in Sarasota, Florida. He urges him not to return to Washington. The plan is for the president to stay in the air until it's safe to return to the White House. Cheney has put into action a contingency plan developed long ago for how the White House should respond in the event of a nuclear strike. At the FAA's command center in Herndon, Virginia, officials instruct all aircraft flying over the United States to land. It's an unprecedented step. During the next three hours, air traffic controllers managed to safely land 4,500 planes at airports across the U.S. and Canada. Aboard United Flight 93 over Eastern Ohio, passenger Tom Burnett places a third call to his wife, Dina. He was so matter-of-fact and he kept saying, don't worry, don't worry, we're going to do something. I knew that they were going into the cockpit. There was no question. 31-year-old Jeremy Glick tells his wife, Liz, that he's preparing to take action. So he was going to take a vote just uh, with three other guys. There were three other guys on the plane um, that were as big as him, going to do something about it. Jeremy then tells his wife to give his love to their newborn baby, Emmy. Jeremy said, if I don't make it out of here, you've got to promise me that Emmy will know how much I love her um, and how much I love you. I'm thinking, you know, you're my high school sweetheart. We're madly in love. This is not the way my life is going to turn out to be. 9.49 a.m. FAA officials in Virginia contact their Washington headquarters about sending fighter jets to find and intercept United 93. The unspoken question is, will the Air Force have to shoot down the hijacked plane? Uh, do we want to think about uh, scrambling aircraft? Oh, God, I don't know. Uh, that's a decision somebody's going to have to make probably in the next 10 minutes. Uh, you know, everybody just left the room. While indecision paralyzes officials on the ground, the passengers on United Flight 93 are gearing up for a revolt. They'll have to lead a charge, single file, up one narrow aisle and overcome three hijackers with knives before reaching the cockpit. I asked him what else I could do. He said, pray, Dina. Just pray. New York, 9.50 a.m. In Lower Manhattan, several thousand firefighters, police officers, and paramedics are at the World Trade Center. People are pouring out of the buildings and into the streets. About 14,000 people have evacuated from the Twin Towers, but about 2,000 are trapped above the impact zones. FBI agent Wesley Wong is stationed at the North Tower command post with police and fire chiefs. He calls FBI headquarters in D.C. and receives some disturbing news. They said that there were um, more planes unaccounted for. I relayed that to all the commanders in there and we were fully expecting to take more hits. What they don't realize is the threat developing a thousand feet above them. When the hijacked airliners rammed into the north and south towers, the explosions blew fireproofing off the building's columns and trusses. 
searing flames fed by thousands of gallons of jet fuel and begun to soften the exposed steel. Temperatures reached 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit inside the impact zones. Both towers are only minutes away from collapse. I can tell you from someone who was there in the command center, there was no talk of those buildings collapsing. This footage shows firefighters burdened by their heavy clothing and equipment heading into the Trade Center. They join hundreds of others already climbing upstairs toward the impact floors of both towers. We would take a quick, quick little breather every five or six floors, just um, 10 seconds, 15 seconds. Um, to put your mask down, put your tools down, just, you know, take a little breath for 10, 15 seconds and then grab your equipment and start going again. The average firefighter carrying 100 pounds of gear takes an hour to climb 25 flights of stairs. At this rate, most firefighters face a three to four hour hike before reaching the impact floors in either building. Battalion Chief Richard Picciano is heading up to the 35th floor of the North Tower. He's aware that this is the biggest rescue operation in the history of the FDNY. I knew firemen were going to be injured and, and killed that day. Uh, just the nature of the job we had in front of us. In the South Tower, Battalion Chief Oreo Palmer, a marathon runner, has taken an elevator to the 41st floor, then raced up the stairwell to the 78th floor. He's joined by Fire Marshal Ronald Buka, another avid runner who's climbed all the way from the ground floor. Palmer and Buka are the first to reach an impact zone in either tower. 9.52 a.m. Palmer surveys the damage on the 78th floor. He radios the men of Ladder Company 15 who are on their way up. I saw in the pockets of fire. We should be able to knock it down with two lines. Where you where you, where you know that? 78 floor, no more 1045 code ones. 1045 code ones means dead bodies. Keep what stair you in. South Tower, Adam. South Tower. 478. Tell us all here. No more civilians. We're going to get two engines up here. All right, tell us we're on our way. Nine fifty-five a.m. The outer columns and trusses from the seventy-seventh floor up to the eighty-fifth floor of the south tower are ready to give way. While firemen from Ladder Company Fifteen are climbing up to the impact zone, another member of their company is descending from the forty-first floor by elevator. It's the only elevator working in the tower. Fire commanders on the ground are waiting to use this elevator to send more men up. But the car suddenly shuts down, trapping the firefighter inside. Go ahead, 15 roof. Stuck in the elevator, in the elevator shaft, you're gonna have to get a different elevator. We're chopping through the wall to get out. At the impact zone, up on the 78th floor, Chief Oreo Palmer and Fire Marshal Ronald Buka stay to fight the blaze among the dead and the dying. Palmer again tries to reach members of Ladder Company 15. It is the last time anyone hears from either Chief Palmer or Fire Marshal Buka. 9.53 a.m. Inside the coach cabin of United Flight 93, passenger Jeremy Glick and three others have taken a vote They've decided to rush the cockpit and try to take back the plane. The revolt will be joined by a number of passengers, including Tom Burnett, Todd Beamer, and Mark Bingham. The plane is now within 200 miles of pilot Ziad Jarrah's target, the U.S. Capitol building. Tom Burnett calls home a fourth and last time. He told me that they were waiting until they were over a rural area to take back the airplane. I felt that he just wanted me to be there for him. 
Jeremy Glick reassures his wife Liz one more time before he sets the phone down. He said, all right, I'm going to do it. He said, stay on the line. Um, I'll be right back. I gave the phone to my dad. Um, I went into the bathroom and started throwing up. The men decide it's time. I told him that I loved him. And he came to the phone and said, don't worry. We're going to do something. And that was the last thing I heard. 9.57 a.m. The battle for United Flight 93 begins. The cockpit recordings not yet released capture screams, loud thumps, and shattering glass and plates. The sounds of a sustained passenger assault. Burnett, Glick, and others fight to break into the cockpit. Hijacker pilot Ziad Jarrah rolls the plane sharply to the left and right. Then he pitches the nose up and down to throw the men off balance. My dad said that he heard two series of screams, almost like it sounded like a roller coaster. 9.58 a.m. Todd Beamer puts down his airphone and says to nearby passengers, Are you ready? Okay, let's roll. He joins the assault in progress. After several moments, Jarrah stabilizes the airplane. He exclaims, is that it? Should we finish it off? A fellow hijacker replies, no, not yet. When they all come, we finish it off. The revolt only intensifies. One passenger yells, in the cockpit. If we don't, we'll die. Finally, a hijacker shouts, Allah Akbar, Arabic. For God is great. United 93 plunges toward the earth at 580 miles an hour. It crashes into a field in Shanksville, Pennsylvania. Then I remember at some point going into the kitchen maybe to get a drink and my dad walking the other way and he just stopped and hugged me and he started crying and I remember looking at him and saying wait you think he's dead New York 958 a.m. clearly we're in the middle of the worst ever act of terrorism and it may not be over TV reporter Mike Sheehan and cameraman Dave Corporon are standing on Church Street about 100 yards due east of the Twin Towers. We decided uh, the best thing for us now is we got to get inside. We figured we might be able to get into one of the towers. Not, not to go up, but to maybe get in the lobby. The men are about to enter the South Tower when a Port Authority officer refuses them entry and pushes them back up the street. I love you too. I love you. I love you. Four blocks south of the Trade Center, Stanley Premnath and Brian Clark, two men who narrowly escaped from the South Tower, look back in awe at the burning skyscrapers. I'm holding on to the fence of the Trinity Church, and I'm telling Brian. This building is going down. And I don't have a clue why I'm telling Brian this. And he stopped me. So that's just drapery and carpets and furniture burning. And I didn't finish the sentence. When way up high, you could see the glass starting to burst out into space. And boom, 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 boom. 9.59 a.m. The outer columns of the South Tower finally give way.
people around me, sort of in my peripheral vision, taking off. Everybody just taking off. I see our other cameraman, Jack. He says, look out behind you, look out behind you. And I turn and I swing to my left and the debris field was roaring up Broadway. run just trying to get indoors someplace and there's nowhere to get indoors I'm not gonna see my wife I'm not gonna see my four-month-old daughter again I'm I'm gonna suffocate right here in the middle of Broadway amid the chaos Usman Farman a credit analyst and Muslim is racing up West Street I'm running, 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 and I completely, you know, like misstepped, like pothole, or, you know, maybe just fell over myself. I'm lying on my back, and this guy comes up to me. He had a, a, a yarmulke and, you know, curly sideburns and a full beard. He's probably the last person I would have ever thought to kind of, you know, pick me up and be like, let's go. Go! go. He says, hey, brother, take my hand. Let's get out of here. The two men, one Muslim, one Jew, both New Yorkers, take off running together. They lose each other in the crowd. On the 35th floor of the still-standing North Tower, Fire Chief Richard Picciotto freezes in his tracks with two dozen other firefighters. I'm just looking up, ex expecting that the, the ceiling is just going to explode in a second. And, and then the noise and the shaking goes right through us. It just goes right through us. You could hear it above us, and then it goes right through. You could hear it, like, on top of us, and then hear it below us. And then from this tremendous noise, the shaking, Silence. <laughs> Louis Leshy, who escaped from the 86th floor of the North Tower, is lying on the floor of the shopping mall that runs below the World Trade Center. He's covered in dust and debris. I called out. Um, it was pitch black. You can, and I remember saying to myself, and I'll, I'll clean it up a bit. I'm not going to die in this place. You want to know what I said? I'm not going to die in this place. This is crap, and I'm not going to die here. And I made up my mind then I wouldn't. Two blocks east of the Trade Center, the smothering blanket of ash gradually settles. The whole city became very soft. All we could hear was your voice. Little particles are falling, like it's still snowing. Like if you survived a nuclear winter, this would have this would have looked like. Inside the North Tower, Richard Picciotto and his men huddle near the elevators on the 35th floor. Then, over the FDNY radio, we heard the towers down. Towers down. What tower? 
I knew what happened. I just didn't want to believe it. So, you know, you talk about a sickening feeling in the, in, in the gut of your stomach. Uh, you know, the first thing I knew was, you know, how many people do I know have just died? Picciotto realizes that the North Tower is also bound to collapse. You know, in the back of my mind, there's this ticking going on. This ticking is that bomb that's going to go off any second. So I got to get these people out quick. Shanksville, Pennsylvania, 10, 10 a.m. Firefighters arrive at the crash site of United Airlines Flight 93. They find no survivors. Air traffic controllers in Cleveland lost the plane on radar and still don't realize that it crashed. Cleveland contacts the Northeast Air Defense Sector, known as NIADS. NIADS cannot locate the aircraft either, so they call the Washington Air Traffic Control Center. United 93, have you got information on that yet? Yeah, he's down. He's down? Yes. When did he land? Because we he, had confirmation. He did, he did not land. Oh, he's down? Dina Burnett learns about her husband's fate on television. I just remember almost falling, the strength of my body just fading away completely. I never felt such sorrow for, for any reason. New York, 10, 10 a.m. Judy, I am at the intersection of Broadway and Chambers Street, where it looks as if police are trying to virtually evacuate the whole lower Manhattan area. In the North Tower of the World Trade Center, Fire Chief Richard Picciotto is descending from the 35th floor. He knows he's running out of time. He shouts evacuation orders across the FDNY radio and races to all three stairwells with a bullhorn to get people out. I'm abandoning the people that are trapped above. It was one of the hardest decisions I ever made. I like to tell myself that most of the people that were trapped above the point of impact were really probably dead by this point. Uh, maybe not by fire, but by the smoke inhalation because they were stuck there for an hour and a half or so. And, you know, uh, we had to get the, the rescuers out. I had to get the firemen and the emergency people out. On the 64th floor, Port Authority engineer Pasqual Bozzelli and his 15 colleagues are waiting inside their office for rescuers to arrive. They're located in the northwest corner of the building, with no view of the South Tower, so they don't know it collapsed. An hour before, Bazelli and his co-workers had called building security. They had been told to stay put. Bazelli then phoned his wife Louise at their New Jersey home to tell her that he was okay. And I said, well, why aren't you leaving? Why are you still there? And he said, don't worry, the police or firemen or whoever are going to be on the way up. When I saw the first building come down, I thought, oh my God, his building is just like that one. Bozzelli and his colleagues dialed building security again. Now they are told to get out. They begin the long trek down from the 64th floor. And I know he was still in there. Is it going to be a matter of time before it's his building that's coming down? Arlington, Virginia, 10, 10 a.m. At the Pentagon, Sergeant Chris Brayman and Lieutenant Colonel Ted Anderson try running back inside the impact zone to rescue more workers, but are stopped by firemen. It was very confrontational. There were people thinking, let's bum rush the firemen and just try and get in on our own. Just as we were being restrained to going back in, there was a, um, the building collapsed. 33 minutes after the attack, a giant slice of the Pentagon's west perimeter caves in from top to bottom. There's no doubt in my mind we would all be dead had it not been for the firemen. New York, 
10.21 a.m. Twenty-two minutes after the collapse of the World Trade Center's South Tower, Louis Leshy climbs out from the underground mall and into daylight. And I called my wife and I told her I was fine. And I said, this is funny, I'm going to walk uptown, I'll do some window shopping. I had no concept. Uh, people said that I was going on uh, a rush, a high. Inside the North Tower, Fire Chief Picciotto does a quick sweep of each floor as he heads down stairwell B. I was trying to be the last person down. I was trying to, uh, you know, keep everyone moving and keep everyone pushed down. Chief Picciotto finishes his sweep of the seventh floor. He's trailing just behind a pack of more than 50 firefighters and civilians. 1,070 feet above them, the inner core of the building buckles. All of a sudden, about the sixth floor, that noise started again. That noise, that loud noise, that shaking. 10.28 a.m., the North Tower begins to fall. Is that the second building of the World Trade Center going? Yes, that is the second. I that is the second the tower. Second that is the second tower. Watching my husband die right in front of me, and I can't do anything about it. New York City's twin towers lie in ruins. Osama bin Laden and Al Qaeda have carried out the most devastating act of terrorism in history. Three hours later, rescuers are searching for survivors in a mountain of twisted steel and rubble. On top of that mountain, a man regains consciousness. It is Port Authority engineer Pasquale Buzelli. The first thought in my mind when I opened up my eyes is that I'm dead. I was just kind of thinking that, you know, like in the movies, I guess, Angel would come by and all of a sudden you'd float <laughs> out of your body and see yourself there, uh, you know, dead. And, uh, and just as I was thinking that, I coughed and I felt pain in my leg. And, you know, I said to myself, I'm alive. Bozzelli was in the stairwell at the 22nd floor when the tower fell. He rode down the rest of the way as the tower collapsed around him. He is perched on a slab four stories in the air. His worst injury, a broken leg. The only way down is a 15-foot drop onto a pile of sharp metal. I call out for help or call out for people that were with me, you know, to see if they just heard, heard nothing. Um, and then finally I heard someone calling out for Richie. Um, and I yelled out, help, help, you know, I'm up here. Bozzelli gets the attention of a group of firefighters. The Richie they are looking for is Fire Chief Richard Picciotto. About 50 feet away, Picciotto is buried with 13 other survivors inside what's left of the tower's core stairwell. From the sixth floor down, this lone section of stairs withstood the collapse. As the dust clears, Picciotto and the other survivors see a sliver of light above them. They claw their way toward the light and out from the rubble. The battalion chief surveys the fiery wasteland around him. I'm out, but all I see is devastation. I'm thinking this is a nuclear shock, shock wave that 
I don't know if it took half of New York City or half of New York State. The World Trade Center is no more. What was there this morning when we woke up is now gone. After the collapse of the Twin Towers, firefighters and police converge at Ground Zero to dig by hand for survivors. They form bucket brigades to remove debris and look for their missing brothers. There was a, a, an overall compulsion to want to do something, even if it meant doing something as, as marginally effective as a bucket brigade. There's little they can do. The Twin Towers are now an impenetrable pile of steel and concrete. Hospitals stand by with their triage units, anticipating a flood of injured from ground zero. Slowly it became clear that there would be no living coming out. 8.30 p.m. President Bush addresses a stunned nation from the Oval Office. He announces an aggressive new policy toward terrorism. We will make no distinction between the terrorists who committed these acts and those who harbor them. Terrorism is no longer going to be thought of as a crime. It's going to be thought of as an act of war. The United States is no longer going to pursue individual terrorist gangs only. It's going to pursue also governments that use terrorism as a tool of power. The first target, Afghanistan where the radical Islamic Taliban government is harboring Osama bin Laden and Al-Qaeda. We needed to be at war, aggressively, effectively at war. We need to be at war against the people who were our real threats and who demonstrated their willingness to kill Americans. Across the U.S., civilian aircraft are grounded. In the skies, an eerie silence pierced only by the occasional roar of Air Force fighter jets. At CIA headquarters, counterterrorism officials have scanned the passenger lists of the four hijacked flights. They recognized the names of two Al-Qaeda operatives. We were um, shocked at the carnage, we, uh, but we were certainly not surprised. We really, I think in a pretty short order, got a pretty good picture of who was involved. I don't think anyone who had worked on this problem expected any less than what happened on 9-11. If it surprised the policymakers, then shame on them. Midnight at Ground Zero. The search and rescue effort unfolds within the smoking hills of rubble. Hundreds of shoes litter the site, yet not a single corpse lies in view. Each collapse was highly centralized and localized. And that was, that was the, the plus-minus aspect of, of living or dying at the World Trade Center when the buildings fell. If you were within the zone, these concentrated zones, basically the footprint of the buildings themselves, you were going to die. At the center of all this activity, the jagged remnants of the Twin Towers reach toward the sky. The city faces a daunting recovery and cleanup effort in the months ahead. We took a, a big punch and we got knocked on our ass and people wanted to show the world that we could, you know, dust ourselves off and get back up. September 12th, the sun rises over lower Manhattan. The fires beneath ground zero are still burning. FBI agent Wesley Wong returns to the site and finds volunteers from the night before still digging for survivors. As he approaches the pile, he recognizes a chorus of chirping sounds. They're the signals given off by the electronic locators worn by firemen. What you heard that morning was hundreds of these locators chirping.
a lot of the widows really didn't know what to do. It became another nightmare uh, of, you know, are they going to find my husband? Are they going to find a part of him? Uh, half of them, they never found anything. Photos and flyers of the missing wallpaper of the city, especially in lower Manhattan. If anyone has any idea if they've seen him or knows where he is, to call us. He's got two little babies. Two little babies. You still see the faces. You know, we, the people put up faces of their loved ones, pictures. The park where the kids were playing, where it was now littered with photographs of loved ones. And you looked at those each and every day, and you know, you, have, you know, you try to imagine that this, is a, this was once a living, breathing human being. 2,740 people will be confirmed dead at the World Trade Center, including 157 who were aboard the two planes that hit the towers. At the Pentagon, the death toll is 189, including the 64 passengers and crew from Flight 77. And in Shanksville, Pennsylvania, there are 44 dead. The total death toll from 9-11, 2,973. In the weeks that follow, Americans struggle to find their footing in a new world known as post 9-11. For the first several days, television coverage is non-stop. The most air time for any story since the assassination of President Kennedy. Within a week, the broadcast networks return to regular programming. Commercial air travel, grounded for four days, resumes nationwide. And the New York Stock Exchange reopens after a six-day shutdown, the longest since the Great Depression. In October, a terrorist mails letters contaminated with anthrax to members of the U.S. Senate and the media. That same month, President Bush signs the Patriot Act into law, giving the federal government new powers to combat terrorism and American military forces prepare to invade bin Laden's sanctuary, Afghanistan. It is the epic battle that Osama bin Laden had hoped for. But bin Laden vastly underestimates the American military. Kabul falls on November 13, 2001. Yet bin Laden manages to slip across the border into Pakistan. He's hiding someplace in, in Pakistan, uh, probably on the border, and he's being hosted by Afghan and Pakistani tribals who live in that ungoverned area. He's welcomed there because he's a hero to them now. Uh, he defies the world for, in the name of Islam. Uh, he's bigger than life because he's eluded us and he has money. May 30th, 2002. A ceremony marks the end of the eight and a half month cleanup at Ground Zero. On the one year anniversary of 9-11, Pakistani authorities arrest Ramzi bin al-Sheib after a gunfight in Karachi. He is the Hamburg cell member who couldn't get a U.S. visa and became bin Laden's go-between with the hijackers. Six months later, CIA and Pakistani agents capture Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, the engineer of the 9-11 plot. They roust him from his sleep in a villa near Islamabad and transfer him to a U.S. military base in Afghanistan. In custody, he provides details of the 9-11 plot and admits that he was the mastermind. March 2003. President Bush leads the U.S. into a war that he defines as the next step in the new post-9-11 foreign policy. U.S. forces invade Iraq and topple the regime of Saddam Hussein, a dictator who was left in power at the end of the first Gulf War. 
after not also in march the national commission on the terrorist attacks against the united states holds its first public meeting july 2004 the commission issues its final report this was a failure of policy management capability and above all a failure of imagination october 29 2004 just four days before the u.s presidential election bin laden releases a videotaped statement we had to destroy the towers in america so they taste what we tasted and they stop killing our women and children bin laden's been very clear his his message has been a defensive message that what we want is the americans out of the middle east this is this is osama bin laden legacy the man who dared to actually to say the american you interfering in our business we will interfere in your business you are killing our people i am killing your people in many ways osama bin laden has achieved what he originally set out to as a young mujahideen even if bin laden is killed or captured there is sufficient momentum for the jihad campaign against the west to continue because he has galvanized a movement that will certainly outlast him I heard it repeatedly after the 93 World Trade Center bombing by saying they didn't kill enough people. It wasn't said by militants, it was said by FBI agents. They didn't say it because they wanted more blood, but they understood that it would take more blood in order to get the government to react. And now I'm hearing other FBI and other officials say to me, Steve, we're going to need another 9-11. I don't think the American people have a good idea of what a long and bloody road this is going to be. Since 9-11, that long and bloody road has become bloodier still. Al-Qaeda is no longer just a terror network, it's a movement that operates worldwide. October 12th, 2002. A series of bombs hit a nightclub district in Bali, Indonesia. The blast killed nearly 200 people, most of them tourists. March 11, 2004. Explosives hidden inside backpacks blow apart four commuter trains in Madrid during the morning rush hour. The attack kills 191 people. July 7, 2005, bombs tear through three underground trains and a double-decker bus in downtown London. At least 55 people are killed. July 23, 2005, in the popular resort town of Sharm el-Sheikh, Egypt, car bombs kill at least 88 people. It was sometime in November 2001 when Osama bin Laden met with a Pakistani journalist in a mountain hideout in Afghanistan. In the distance, the two men could hear the sounds of U.S. bombs and anti-aircraft fire. Bin Laden used the opportunity to explain the culture of violence that defines radical Islam. This place may be bombed and we will be killed, he said. We love death. The U.S. loves life. That is the big difference between us.